Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the November 2022 Health Environment and Social Services Committee meeting for Brooklyn Community Board 2. Uh, my name is Brandon Smith. I'm the chair of the committee. Um, I have a few protocols to read out at the beginning of the meeting, so please pay quick attention. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, for public access and archiving in accordance with New York State Open Meetings Law. It's the practice of Community Board 2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee member cameras on. Public attendees are also encouraged to leave their cameras on, particularly if you're given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. To maintain an appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for public comment uh, for comment by board members, as well as comments by committee members. If you have a question that falls outside of public comment time, please type your question in the chat panel. We will address it as time permits. You may also email the district office at any time outside of these meetings. We are committed to providing access for all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. If you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours before a public meeting. We also ask that everyone speak and present using plain language, speak at a moderate tone, and frequently ask if you're speaking loud enough. We are delighted to have some folks with disabilities who come to our meetings. So if you're presenting, please read the title of every slide and describe on any images on the slide, such as photos, graphs, and charts, so everybody can participate. Finally, I just want to ask that it, it's a expectation of everybody on the committee, as well as everyone in attendance at the Zoom meeting, that we all treat each other with respect. That goes whether you're a committee member, member of the public, um, member of the board, or a applicant. Um, anybody who's not being respectful will be removed from the Zoom meeting. So. Uh, with that, I think I have finished my uh, meeting protocol, and we'll start with the folks here introducing themselves. I'm uh, delighted to invite my co-chair, Ms. McKnight, to introduce herself next. Good evening, everyone. I'm Nicole McKnight, um, Vice Chair of HES and also a board member. Excellent. Um, our secretary, Ms. Thurston. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Thurston. I am the secretary of this HESS committee, as well as the secretary of the full board. Great. We also have Mr. Alejandro Varela in attendance. Mr. Varela, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Alejandro Varela here. I'm still walking home from school pickup, and I will get to the laptop shortly. Okay. We're, we're happy to have you. And Ms. Miller, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh-oh, you're on mute, Taya. Boy, I did it. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Uh, Taya Miller from the district office. Excellent. Thanks for joining. And thanks, everybody else, for joining, too. Um, quick education and math uh, lesson for all of us. Uh, the community board meetings proceed when with action when they have quorum. And this committee requires six members in attendance to have quorum. Currently, we have four. And we will get going with some of our non-voting items uh, before, and hopefully we'll be able to get a, a couple of other board members on, or committee members on the line in that time. So what I'm gonna suggest, and we'll, we'll do this when we rearrange the uh, agenda, is we invite our guest, um, Mr. Uh, Razik Seabrook, uh, from National Grid uh, to provide his presentation on um, CLCPA. And are, are you talking about uh, 2050 also or, or just CLCPA? Uh, so basically, I'm here to talk about kind of the draft scoping plan. So it's kind of all inclusive of, you know, the 2050, 2030, 2040 goals. Great. How much time do you think you'll need? 
this is a condensed version of a much longer presentation, just given that we're doing this in the evening. I certainly don't want to hold you guys up too long. So no longer than seven to 10 minutes maximum. Great. Well, Mr. Seabrook, it's a pleasure to have you here this evening, and I welcome you to start your presentation. Thank you for having me. I will start by sharing my screen here. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you, Brandon, for that. And uh, I, I would like to know a lot of uh, your caveats about uh, being uh, being conscious of you know abilities. Um, and so to the extent that I talk too fast as, as New Yorkers tend to do, and though I don't adequately describe something that's on a slide, um, excuse me, please let me know. Um, having said that, um, again, giving a very truncated version of this um, presentation. And so um, if any follow-up is necessary required, um, I can certainly come back and, you know, give any more detail. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade. I am not an engineer. So to the extent that these things are hyper-technical in some instances, I can come back with, you know, subject matter experts that can speak um, more specifically to certain aspects of that. Um, so with that being said, um, again, like as noted, what I'm here to do, talk today is about the CLCPA and specifically um, the Climate Action Council and what they're what they're implementing is something called the draft scoping plan, which is basically their high level roadmap of how they intend to hit um, some of the targets and goals um, outlined in the CLCPA. Our president, Rudy Winter of National Grid New York, calls this quote, the most important conversation that no one is having. Right. And so as Razik Seberg, I am the uh, jurisdictional manager for customer and community affairs for the borough of Brooklyn, which is our largest territory. Right. And so as you know, your energy provider, um, I think it's imperative that we all get you the information um, that is very key and you know, essential to you know, what you all are doing I and mean, how it will affect your everyday lives. And I'm sure you'll get a number of questions. Um, what I'd liken this to those who aren't aware. Um, with state policy is local law 97, which I'm sure you all are much more familiar with likely um, in terms of the impact that it has on everyday people. And you know, the state and the city have passed some very progressive things that we as a company support, but to the extent that you know, we hear from you as customers day to day and some of the pain points that you have. Um, what we're here to do is kind of discuss you know, where the Climate Action Council is in their process. Um, some practical challenges to what they're posing, right? Again, not that we're in opposition to anything that they're presenting per se, it's just that to the extent that this is where they are, um, we think that given we have to interact with customers, some of the you know logistical challenges that we have to some of the things that they're proposing, um, to the extent that it is currently state law, so National Grid is doing things to comply with the law, so I'll you know spend a little bit of time with that, and then also I'd include some of the suggestions that you know we raise with you know state the state specifically and you know some local decision makers as well um, re relative to some of the things that we think can strengthen um, the law. Um, so with that being said, um, before I begin the the slide deck, I would say. Um, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, right? I understand it's, it's in the evening and you know we're talking about energy policy, right? Not you know the most compelling thing. But if so if you take nothing away from this presentation, high level, just four things, right? CLCPA basically says what we have to do, not how we have to do it, right? It's a it's a, a function of how we reduce emissions. So to that extent, we believe again, we should take a diverse approach to how we achieve those goals for a number of reasons, um, namely um, feasibility, right? For a lot of the state, um, Buffalo is not Brooklyn. So a heat pump in Buffalo doesn't necessarily work as well as it work in the place like Brooklyn, right? And so when we think about a diverse suite of um, technologies, that's something that we'd like to include. Same thing goes for reliability, right? The draft scoping plan largely uh, focuses on uh, electrification. Um, to the extent that that is the predominant way in which, you know, decarbonization is intended to happen to the extent that, you know, there's any, there's ever a disruption um, in the electric supply chain. It is something that we have a concern about as it relates to the reliability in neighborhoods, uh, particularly for, you know, critical infrastructure, hospitals, schools and things of that nature, but also just residents, right? We don't necessarily, you know, having power outages in the middle of winter are, are you know, kind of our nightmare scenarios and stuff. So I'm from a reliability concern. Um, that's something that's hyper important to us. And then lastly, affordability, right? So 
at the end of the day, we understand that transition costs, right? We spent billions of dollars, you know, standing up what the current infrastructure looks like. Um, but to the extent that we are uh, seeking to transition from that current infrastructure, um, what that next phase looks like is very, what that next phase looks like um, will be highly uh, dependent on affordability and contingent on what we can actually pay for in real time. It, it is, uh, it is, uh, ever incumbent upon us, particularly, you know, these times where, you know, supply chain issues, inflation, things of that nature, rising costs of energy. Uh, we know there's it's pain points. And so we are just urging that the state to consider, we're urging the state to consider, you know, the cost of the transition, not only for, you know, the state itself, not only for large consumers of energy, but really for every individual customers. Um, and just factually speaking, one of the things that we have concerns is, is that the draft scoping plan doesn't necessarily break down costs to the customer level, unfortunately, something that we can't ignore as you know, energy provider to all this customer. So that being said, um, here's the, I'm gonna start the presentation. Um, some of the things, some of the slides I'll breeze over because um, again, out of interest of time um, and just because some of the things that I've already spoke to you guys high level about, but again, if anything um, I say you guys have questions about or would like me to follow up on, I'm really willing able to do so. Uh, so high level sales CPA and the CAC is just, you know, again, um, the state's plan to um, achieve the goals, achieve uh, climate uh, gas emission reduction goals um, by certain benchmarks. Largely, it's 85% by 2050, uh, which Brandon was um, outlined at the beginning of this presentation. And then the function of which they were the conduit by which they are um, implementing this plan is called the quote um, scoping plan. And currently it's in draft form. Um, it's been out for about a year. They've done a number of hearings and things of that nature. Um, but we also understand that a lot of, you know, individuals that haven't had the time to get to these hearings, which is why I'm here today doing these you know, presentations. Um, draft scoping plan uh, has certain, you know, hard benchmarks, you know, if you know, uh, we were like 6,000 megawatts of solar by 2025, 70% of all energy to be renewable by 2030, which is in seven years, um, completely electrifying the, uh, excuse me, uh, decarbonizing the electric grid by 2040, um, no new gas served to existing buildings, no new, ga no new gas hookups to newly constructed buildings by 2024. Um, I intentionally kept this no new gas appliances slide in here by 2030 um, and it's actually been pushed back to 2025 and the reason why I kept that in is because even as the state starts to consider some of the goals outlined in the plan they're starting to realize that they have been in some instances too ambitious and don't necessarily have a way in which to reach these goals and so even that 2030 number currently has been pushed back to 20. 20, 2035. And I also note the 2030, another 2030 number where uh, the state plan posits that we will have 70% uh, of all energy by renewables um, done by 2030, which in context, the state to date, right, all the development that has been done since the inception of the state, we currently have around 27, 28% of all of our energy coming from renewable energy, um, which is uh, troubles some considering how long that development has been going on. And so now the current scoping plan, again, from a feasibility pr and practicality perspective is now positing that we're gonna effectively triple that amount of renewable energy um, within the state within seven years. And frankly, I don't even think we can get to the permitting process um, within the seven years. As you all know, you're very familiar with rezonings. Um, and so imagine doing rezonings effectively statewide um, to try to implement some of these things. Um, just saying that to say again, you know, there's a practicality a challenge to what the state is positing. And we're just to the extent that um, they have such ambitious goals, we understand like these are why they are goals. We have to be responsible for ensuring that we provide reliable energy while this transition is happening. So to the extent that we can't reach that 2030 goal, um, we are positing that we need to ensure that there's a redundancy of the system to ensure reliability um, as it relates to getting customers energy. Some of the things that are good about this draft scoping plan, again, um, I'll kind of breeze over this slide, but basically, you know, all of fundamentally we are in agreement with the plan. Um, some of the things that we have concerns with are timelines and then again, the methodology as it relates to how we get to the plan. So again, we believe in lower emissions, you know, expanded energy, frankly, it is our um, number one way in which energy efficiency is the number one way in which we envision, you know, 
reaching a lot of these carbon goals, because frankly, a lot of this existing building stock um, could just be frank, much more efficient and that will do much more than uh, in certain instances than um, refit, retrofitting infrastructure. Um, hybrid gases, you know, cu adding customer choices for appliances, heat pumps, you know, things of that nature. Um, low carbon and renewable, net, low carbon, um, renewable natural gas and green hydrogen, which are things that we will talk about from a practicality perspective um, that we support, right? So these are all things that are included within the plan um, that we will support. Um, again, just showing in this slide how much we are very much aligned with what the plan says. Um, some of the things where that we take issue with, right? The banning of gas appliances and taking away customer choice, right? So to the extent that after date certain, your, your appliance were to break, um, break down, you can no longer replace it with a gas appliance, which again is of concerning considering uh, what it will look like to retrofit a home from an energy perspective to uh, pay for a lot of these appliances. Also, to the extent that, you know, electricity is a, is a one of the main bills for a lot of um, New Yorkers, you know, we don't necessarily pay for heat and hot water and things of that nature, right? So the gas bill then becomes preferred to the electric bill and it becomes a higher demand on the electric writ, writ large. So we, again, we, the appliance issue alone is, a, is an issue from a customer perspective, affordability perspective, but it's also a reliability, a practicality perspective as well. Um, our, RNG and hydrogen as options for heating as customers, again, removing customer choice increases um, the cost and decreases the suite of options that are available to customers. Um, things like, oh, the NISO. So the NISO is the New York Independent Systems Operator. Um, they run the power grid. They're responsible for ensuring the safe, uh, the, the safe production and dissemination of energy throughout the state. Um, they have raised reliability concerns as early as 2023. Um, also, as it relates to uh, the year 2026, there's a project that's supposed to be about 80 miles running from uh, Mid-Hudson Valley to Albany. A capital region roughly, which is supposed to basically bring a lot of the renewable energy of renewable and clean electricity from upstate to downstate. Um, that project is supposed to go online in 2026 to the extent that that project doesn't go online for whatever reason. Um, they are largely stuck about how they would achieve some of these electric goals, right? And only know that to say, if reliability for the state of New York and as it relates to this plan is in some ways contingent on these major projects going, all of these major projects going online at the same time without delays, right? We just have concerns as it relates to reliability. Because again, um, when lights go out and energy goes off, no one that wants to necessarily hear, um, you know, it's the state's fault for not being able to get their projects done on time. Um, these are just some of the comments um, that we made to the plan. Um, main, in, maintaining energy affordability is essential. Um, the path to net zero, again, regardless of methodology, must ensure that energy is reliable and resilient, right? To the extent that something were to happen to the energy energy sources for electricity, we need to ensure that there's all, there are alternatives. Um, establishing energy that's equitable for everyone, right? In certain communities, namely places like NYSHA um, and affordable housing communities, they don't necessarily have the opportunity to do a lot of these major retrofits and or to the extent that the state and the city has affordable housing development goals, has goals to support nonprofits, has goals to support um, faith-based institution determinations that we make about the cost of energy will directly affect the amount of customers that can be served by these um, entities and industries that don't necessarily have the um, capacity to offset increases in um, overhead. Um, and then lastly, again, for the workforce, you know, a lot of these jobs are local jobs. People have literally, you know, I mean, I've been at National Grid for six months and then people look at me like I'm, I'm a child, right? A lot of people have been at National literally 10, 20, 30, 40 years, right? Decades in and really have built their lives in and around where they work. And so to the extent that we're disrupting that, we believe there's a, in, there's an equity aspect to the workforce component as well, to the extent that they, you know, dedicated their lives to providing safe energy and their safe inspection, things of that nature. And so we believe that the plan should, you know, more robustly um, incorporate those kind of considerations, which the state agreed with, which is why I believe that they put someone from the AFL CIO on the board about, you know, three or four months ago. Um, this next slide again just talks about customer affordability and practicality. Um, you know, it's something that we that again that we've spoke about, um, but really, um, because the proposal doesn't go down to the consumer level, it's just highly um, 
it, we feel like it just falls short of allowing customers the ability to fully flesh out what this means to them in real life, in real time. Um, and so to the extent that they're not going to take account of that in terms of rep having that represented in the report, we believe that they should do things on the macro level that speak to affordability, like i.e. Um, allowing a diverse suite of options to ensure that cost of in any individual um, energy source isn't the only uh, game in town, if you will. Um, same thing for customer choice. Again, that also speaks to affordability and feasibility, um, ensuring that we have a myriad of uh, types of appliances um, that we can use as the transition happens. Again, we don't believe that the, the perfect should be the enemy of the good or the good should be the end of the perfect, I'll probably say that. Um, that same narrative applies here as it relates to new technologies and innovation, right? So we talk about renewable natural gas. Renewable natural gas is the idea of taking, you know, wastewater, things that would otherwise emit carbon into the atmosphere, processing it and then blending it and then, you know, being able to process it within the system as energy, right? And so we believe, you know, things that not only provide energy, but also remove emissions in that way um, are important. Same thing for green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is the concept of taking wind and solar, um, storing it in green hydrogen cells and then reusing it when the energy is more is um, better suited. You know, the wind doesn't blow at the same rate at the same time, same thing as it goes to the sun. And also you have um, connection issues to the extent that we're building a lot of this offshore energy, how we connect it to the actual grid has also becomes a challenge. And so we believe that solutions like RNG and green hydro Again, not method, methodology notwithstanding, um, allow us to reach the goals of the CLCPA. Um, again, with why leveraging technologies that are being used around the world, frankly, um, to achieve a lot of the goals that are outlined. Um, significant focus on energy efficiency. Um, one of the things that the CLCPA does is basically remove a lot of the incentives for more efficient appliances. Uh, again, we believe this is another instance where the perfect shouldn't necessarily be the enemy of the good. Um, while I certainly understand the logic of, you know, wanting to use all resources to go towards um, clean energy and clean appliances, um, to the extent that is not feasible or practical for certain individuals, uh, I believe that there should be options afforded to them. And frankly, a lot of these programs are rebate programs. And so if you don't have the upfront capital to afford these things, um, you're not in the position to take advantage of um, some of the rebate programs that have been passed. Um, accounting for emissions, this is a little bit more technical, but this kind of speaks to the RNG point whereby um, they were they were account in the in the impact on the environment, they were accounting for how much emissions come from you know, um, using RNG as an energy source, but it didn't account for the emissions that were being uh, decreased by removing the RNG from sitting in landfills and things of that nature. So that's a more technical component of it um, that they have uh, reconciled of sorts. Um, but again, that's just more of a logistical challenge to it. And then lastly, we're talking about the electrification of transport. Again, that's a particular issue in New York City as you think about high rises and what space looks like um, relative to trying to fit anything anywhere <laughs> within communities. Um, and so we just think that, you know, all programs must be aligned um, with the state, local and feds um, as it relates to what energy policy looks like, as it relates to what the CLCPA goals and implementation status looks like, and also as it relates to some of the bills that are being passed on the state and local level. Um, could to effectuate some of these angles. Um, this is an additional resource that I think is helpful. Um, it's called the um, the joint utilities. Basically, um, the all of the energy providers and utilities throughout the state um, have come together and basically given some content in and around on um, what they how what they think about the CLCPA and its process. Um, and so I've included this, and I when I sent over the information to you all as well. It's a package of info that includes a one pager, so you all don't have to peruse their website, but I implore you to go check it out. Excuse me, um, tons of valuable information on that website um, that you guys can take full advantage of that we think I think could be really helpful. Um, and then how to submit, how to engage. You all know, you know, you can always go to your local legislatures and things of that nature. Um, the written comments were supposed to be submitted through July 1st. That's like the form where they had like a written, you know, uh, platform. However, there is the email um, that's still available. So to the extent that you would like to um, go directly to NYSERDA and give them, you know, what you think and how you think they play plan can be better, things that you support, things that you would like them to know specifically about you as an individual, CB2 as a community, you know, your your committee, um, there you can use the scoping plan at NYSERDA um, to comment directly on this. 
Um, and so again, lastly, just from a core message, right? As it relates to the affordability, feasibility, reliability, and the methodology, if you will, they all speak to, you know, affordability and choice, really, you know, ensuring that, you know, the choices that we're making, you know, really speak to the everyday lives of people. As we, as we think about energy prices, right? Food prices are also going up, transportation prices are going up, you know, the, the, the plan calls for um, no combustible engine cars to be sold after 2035, which again becomes a, 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 an additional demand on both people's pockets and, you know, the electric grid itself. So again, we think the affordability and, and choice are preeminent as it relates to what we should be prioritizing. Um, the supply, um, again, alone, just through wind and solar, we cannot meet the electric goals. And so from a reliability and feasibility perspective, we believe that a more diverse suite of options are necessary. Um, and then again, around, around an economic growth, a lot of the, the job, a lot of the other factors that I noted also affect you know, employees ability to hire and developers availability to develop. Um, and so some of these things uh, we know for sure are factors as we talk to people around the city and around the state, um, and we implore um, the state to be supportive um, and cognizant of these things um, as they make their final decision. And then lastly, I would just say to wrap the presentation, what National Grid is doing um, in terms of our fossil free vision um, is a very nuanced plan. It's 40 pages. I will not go into it. I will spare all of your time, but largely it's based off of four pillars, right? Energy efficiency, as we said, again, as outlined in the, C in the COCPA and the scoping plan, we believe that no less than 50% of emissions reductions will just come from making the building stock more efficient. Um, with that, you know, so we are full supportive of that. We have a number of programs that, you know, speak to that both on the uh, uh, commercial level and residential level that we can certainly circle back on. A targeted electrification in geothermal. So where practical, where possible, electrifying wherever we can. Um, geothermal energy, which is using, um, in, which is using the heat from the ground as energy. Um, we have a number of pilots going on throughout the state. Um, in the city, upstate and Long Island that we're exploring. So these are things, technologies that are noted in the plan that we are fully supportive of. Hybrid system. So using the, you, leveraging the gas network on the coldest days, for instance, to get your home to temperature or get a commercial building to temperature and then switching to renewable energy to maintain that temperature, which is something that as we think about upstate and you know the places that have, fortunately for us, a little bit more brutal winters than we, brutal winters than we do, you know, a hybrid approach to, you know, address, you know, the ways in which uh, the regional differences throughout the state. And then the use of diverse technologies like renewable natural gas and green hydrogen, because again, we believe that that not only is a reliability concern only using one technology, but also to the extent that we have affordability concerns. Um, we believe that having a diverse suite of energy sources is the best way to ensure that we are addressing the um, challenges holistically. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all for allowing me to present. Um, apologies if I spoke too fast or anything I said was uh, what popped up on the slide it was um, not adequately stated. Um, I see Jessica has her hand up. I assume that's for a question. So if you guys have any questions, please. Great, we'll get to questions in just a second. But first of all, Mr. Seabrook, thank you very much for your presentation. I greatly appreciate your time and coming to our meeting with the, with the update on things. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but you come on the heels of a presentation we had last year from your colleague, Mr. Shabazzpour, um, the oh. Director of Regulatory Affairs, who came to our committee to speak about 2050. And we had a pretty dynamic presentation um, from a number of different National Grid folks last year um, on the issues of cyber technology, um, on the issues of local law, uh, the local law 152, um, and also this uh, net zero 2050 initiative. And I found it interesting. I appreciated your comment that you we might be able to get some additional experts that that uh, that could come back and speak to us, particularly maybe somebody from a with like a science background. As much as I appreciate lawyers, I'm a lawyer too. I, 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 I can appreciate that. I noted that for the cybersecurity, you all sent us the chief technology officer of the corporation who was an absolute expert in his field. For local law 152, the fellow that I, you all sent, I, I think this guy could inspect the, the gas facilities in my building very adequately. He was an enormous expert, but we, we end up getting 
folks like yourself who are wonderful, but from the corporate affairs team and from the regulatory department at National Grid when it comes to climate change, which we love to have you, but it's nice to have experts also. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask, and because Mr. Shabazzpour, when he came and spoke to us, said he would get back to us on a few different items, and it would be great to to potentially follow up on a couple of those items. And um, I, I, I have some specific questions, uh, but I'll, I'll let the committee kind of weigh in. But I would just ask if in the context of these questions, our committee is very concerned about climate change and really views this as an emergency where we wanna see some kind of immediate action. And from the perspective of the last presentation, it, was re it really seemed that the rate payers would be responsible for making a lot of the changes between now and 2035. And the, there was this premise that New York City buildings, 30 to 60% of buildings only would be on, would, 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 would only be on electricity by, uh, in, by 2050. And it, it just, it, it gave us some concern, I think, about the degree to which there was a, 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 an a, a, a initiative of emergency towards climate change going on at National Grid, or at least me. But um, I, I I would just want to kind of hear that in the the course of the the answers. And I, but I, I'll defer to the committee to ask specific questions and follow up if there's time. Absolutely. But before the question, let me just respond to a few things. But one, whatever is outstanding from Don. Don's amazing. He's ready, willing, and able to come back. We can bring people from his team. You know, they're the engineers who can speak specifically about you know the technical components. So please, whatever follow up is outstanding, please let me know. Um, as it relates to the urgency of it, I, I never want to seem like I, we are in opposition to this, right? One of the, the way I start with this in terms of like feasibility and practicality is some of the things that we need to be conscious of is the reality of what this looks like for the spectrum of customers. For instance, if you're gonna talk about the electrification of building stock, NYSHA as a community, if you will, needs $40 billion in repairs without any transition whatsoever, right? And so when you think about what a transition looks like for those individuals, we have to be conscious of that because again, those are our customers. And so as we think about uh, a transition, it not only has to be, hey, we are going to transition for those who are single homeowners, for those who are practical, for those, you know, condos associations that can kind of foot the bill and disseminate the cost through a, you know, a, a HOA. We also have to be conscious that there are people who right now can't afford anything. And they're going to be forced to transition based off of state and local mandates. And us as energy provider, we need to be conscious of they need to be able to heat and power their homes too. So I take your, your points again. I, I think that they are certainly um, valid. I think that certainly we are of the level of crisis, right? So we were actually asked the question, you know, relative to the, the politics going on. If the governor's race kind of goes, uh, I won't call it south, but say if it, if it changes hands, right, will that affect National Grid's plan? And what we've said is unequivocally no, because again, this is not something that is, you know, certainly it is a mandate of the state, certainly, but to the extent that our plan is not in opposition to that mandate, our plan is not to undermine that mandate, but what our plan does have to do is include the practical aspects as we look at what the power grid needs, what supply looks like, what demands look like, and then for me, most importantly, what cost looks like on individual customer, because again, as you noted, a, a lot of this plan is um, being put on customers to make the choices to become more efficient and make changes within their homes. Okay, great. And one other reminder just for everyone, because the one thing I'll note about Mr. Shabazzpour's presentation mm -hmm. also, it lasted an hour and a half. And I think if we can if we can all try to keep both the questions, comments, and the answers to under two minutes, that would be really great and would, would help to make sure that we have a, a, an expedited meeting for this evening. So with that, I will ask Ms. Thurston to pose the first question from the committee and we'll follow up with anyone else who has questions as well too. Thanks, Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Okay, hey, um, uh, Mr. Seabrook, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. And please know what, that what I'm about to say is not about you. I, I totally respect your role in a legal role. It's difficult and I, I, I totally respect it. Um, but I must say I'm vibrating with how much this presentation upsets me. Um, I, and I, I must state my credentials why I'm upset. I, I lead corporate sustainability for a global corporation in my day-to-day -day job. And I am a professor at Columbia University in climate science. 
um, ESG corporate governance and sustainability reporting and strategy. So that is my bias. It is towards science. And I, I just have to say for folks who are not in this field day in and day out, there is significant disinformation in this presentation. And I, I am Again, Mr. Seabrook, I, I really, I don't mean to be nasty to you, please know, but um, the, the truth, the truth is not the, the sort of um, what you called, I'm sorry, I'm like truly vibrating, I'm so upset by this, numerous harmful bans, um, those are only harmful to the natural gas company that currently is National Grid and does not need to finance and compensate us for the externalities and the damages it causes every day to the environment and to the health of everyone. This is the Health, Environment, and Social Services Committee. Our priority is to folks not having fire coming out of their faucets, whether they're in Brooklyn or Pennsylvania or beyond where natural gas comes from. Um, their National Grid is trying to put a pipeline through some of the most under-resourced neighborhoods in Brooklyn. It is absolutely inequitable. It is irresponsible. and please just, I would be happy to talk with anyone that has questions about how all of this works, but please know this is just the, the gas company's perspective on this law that has a financial interest in this law not taking place. So I, I hope that natural, National Grid will do more continuous outreach at the local level that we really welcome that. And, um, but I also think there's value in us hearing from the side that might be grounded in a, in a different sort of reality. And so I invite that. I, I just had to share and I, I apologize for being so upset by it, but um, I'll also just share that a lot of these costs um, are, are very likely to be offset, even retrofitting. I am renovating a historic brownstone right now and replacing everything with electric appliances. There are significant rebates. I personally didn't qualify for them and I'm okay with that, um, but they re a lot of folks do. A lot of, most folks will qualify for these rebates and it really, really makes this all affordable and responsible. So again, Mr. Seabrook, thank you. Thank you for hearing me out. And, um, and that concludes my comments. Thanks, Brandon. I, I well, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank oh. you, Jessica. And, and particularly thank you for, despite being concerned about the issue, for keeping your comment within two minutes. Um, yeah. Mr. Mr. Seabrook, if you would like to respond, I'd love to, I, I'd love to hear you. Um, and we can go to the next question after that. Absolutely. And I would try to keep my response uh, as truncated as possible, given a lot of the things that uh, Ms. Thurston has raised. And I appreciate um, you giving your context, right? I think that oftentimes these conversations are ha happening uh, in, a, in a, such a space where it's seen as overtly antagonistic and everyone's just lying to each other and no one believes the other thing that people are saying, right? But I think one of the, I guess the way in which I would address your question is, you know, this is the Health, Environment and Social Services Committee, right? And unfortunately, a lot of the things that we're addressing are a function of social services, right? A lot of the social services that we put forth, right? And so when you think about things like costs, right? Even the, the example that you gave, to the extent that people can't afford the cost of living right now, Unfortunately, a rebate program for them is insufficient to the extent that people are living in, you know, housing that is a uh, old, old, much older building stock, particularly in black and brown neighborhoods. Right. A lot of these uh, transitions, a lot of these things are in and around heat pumps, unfortunately, aren't adequate, particularly even if you think about certain niches. Every individual building aren't on the necessarily the same power grid. So now you're talking about grids that go beyond properties. You're talking about zoning. Once you open up the ground, right, there's a myriad of things that you have to try to figure out just from an engineering perspective beyond the science or the legalities of it all, right? And so I would I would implore I would love I I love the perspective that you bring to the extent that we would like to have a follow-up conversation. I would love to bring on some the Don Shabazz ports and some of our facilities folks to really talk about the logistics of it all. Because again, we are not in opposition to the goals. We're not in opposition to some of the, the, some of the mandates. But again, to the extent that we have to talk to customers every day about how much energy costs right now, to the extent that we're doing things that are going to, regardless of even if we take the scoping plan as is, going to affect energy costs from a, in terms of increasing overall costs, um, we believe that it's imperative that we address some of these more uh, salient issues, particularly as it relates to affordability and reliability, because as we know, um, brownouts happen in certain neighborhoods. So to the extent that there's a reliability concern, these that will disproportionately affect low to moderate income customers, which is a euphemism for black and brown people. Wow. Almost exactly two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Seabrook. Um, 
Mr. Varela. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Seabrook, for a great presentation. Um, I guess I feel like what's missing here from the conversation to echo some of what, what Jessica said is uh, we need a perspective. We need more input from folks who are not benefiting from this, from the sure. sale. You know, of, here there are profits being made. We're sort of living through a time where energy companies are seeing record profits. Um, and so we can't ignore that. It benefits your company to sell as much as possible. Even if ultimately we're all still human and you don't wanna see the destruction of the earth, it's still in the short run benefits you um, and your company not to make these changes or to slow them down. And so we need, to, we need to kind of acknowledge that. We also need to talk a little bit about the fact that there is an urgency here that's missing and we can talk all about choice, you know, but as, as long as we continue, Elon Musk could buy absolutely everything and we'll be happy as long as we have 20 varieties of bagels to choose from that actually doesn't, you know, that, that, that's neither here nor there. Like what we need to focus on is the fact that 33 million people were displaced in Pakistan due to floods as a cause caused by global warming, but that didn't affect us directly. Maybe the Pakistanis among us, but didn't affect us directly. So we, we passed the buck. People on the West coast of the United States can't breathe right now. It doesn't affect us directly. So we'll pass the buck. We happen to be in a privileged spot in the country where we're not hitting, we're not faced, we're not getting sort of hit directly by all of these catastrophes. And so we're going to keep kicking the can down the road and not acting with more urgency. I don't believe, and this is to be fair to you, Mr. Seabrook and your company, I don't believe this should be in your hands. I think your hands should be tied. It should be the government pushing. It should be requiring stricter and at stricter standards and a faster pace. We're kind of, you know, 20 years ago, this conversation around choice and being concerned with who's being left behind, you know, could have slowed this down when the inconvenient truth or whatever that documentary came out. But today we're past that point. And so if black and brown communities, if my communities are going to be left behind, our communities are going to be left behind, then that falls again, a partnership maybe with the resource, the energy companies and the government to pick up the slack for us. It is not for the sort of progress to move more slowly. It is for the safety net to be stronger. Um, I appreciate those sentiments, and Alejandro, and I, and I think that one, in terms of the biases, right, I, again, from a credibility perspective, I, I cannot necessarily speak to what, you know, how much veracity one takes from a global publicly traded corporation. But what I can do is point to things like the NISO, right, New York State Independent Operator, they're apolitical, they are not a, not a for-profit entity, they are exclusively responsible for ensuring that the New York State grid is reliable, and we have the opportunity to provide energy. And so as we speak about about things like reliability and the ways in which the CAC and or the CLCPA is going to actually function. Um, I would point you to um, some of their sentiments, not necessarily ours, because again, you know, we look at this from a day-to-day -day perspective and then we have to incorporate some of these things, but they're just exclusively, they're not even necessarily concerned about cost. There is, they're, um, they're predominantly focused on safety and reliability. Um, and so from a, a veracity perspective, I would just point you to them. Um, I understand, I, look again, again, I think that choice is only a proxy of practicality, right? So unless we're going to address the fundamental issues that, are, that exist in a lot of these communities, I, I think that is, it's difficult for us to have the choice conversation within the vacuum, right? One of the, for instance, one of the biggest issues happening upstate is where you have private employers or private companies going out buying hundreds of acres of land um, attempting to put solar farms on this land and getting blocked by the local community, right? That it's not necessarily an impact on them. They just think it's an ugly blight on their community, right? And so to the extent that we, as the state of New York, are reliant on those local communities to make those decisions, to provide energy from a grid perspective, right? It becomes a challenge for us, particularly in New York City. New York City doesn't, in addition to that, we don't because of, again, other state policies. We don't have the opportunity to take uh, afford the benefits of nuclear power because, again, it was a political decision made to, to um, shut down Indian Point, which at the time gave New York City upwards of 30% of its clean energy. So now not only are we trying to transition um, in a time where energy demand is going up, we've also offlined some of the things that provide a significant amount of that clean energy. Um, as we understand, right, these are all political choices that we are making and we are prioritizing what we are prioritizing from a state's perspective and from a state resource perspective, as you can see, the city has to deal with the migrant crisis. As you see on the state level, we're dealing with affordable housing prices, right? We're dealing with, you know, social service providers and a lot of the clergy saying we're losing out on parishionerships. We can't afford to operate our buildings. So while we certainly understand that there's an urgency in and around uh, climate, there's an urgency in and around the myriad of issues 
issues that, again, the state and the government has to be cognizant of to the extent that we would like resources to exclusively be allocated to climate change. Again, we would love it. This is why, again, we are full throated supporters of the Environmental Bond Act. But with that being said, um, we also have to be cognizant of other things that are factors in these decisions that as they're being made. Okay, well, thank you. Um, just a little bit over the three minutes um, there. So I'll set a timer next time. Apologies. Uh, it, it's all right. I just want to try to make this move smoothly. Um, Ms. Einhorn, you have a question? It's Well, I completely agree with the sentiment that it's 100% political. There are some real world considerations. And my understanding is that Indian Point was actually, the decision was made um, by the Nuclear Commission because of seismic activity in the area, um, how politicized that became. Is, is clear, like nuclear is, is people are afraid of it. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that we're, we're being um, accurate about some of the specifics we're using because um, it's important. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely, I would say that comment was overtly political and I would uh, implore you all to, there's a great floor speech given by James Schoolfish who was currently in the assembly but was at the Senate in the time. Uh, excuse me, currently in the Senate was at the, in the assembly at the time who gave a great floor speech about the impacts of um, what the closure of Indian Point would look like to the tax base of the of his community that he represented and also to what energy reliability and production looks like here in the city. So certainly I think that the Indian Point conversation was nuanced. Just only to point that out to say the difference between what upstate and downstate looks like is largely based off of they can take advantage of something that provided a significant amount of clean energy in the city previously. Well, thank you. Um, I, we can for one second I just want to raise my questions um, specifically I know we're talking about 2025 and 2030 and 2050 but we had previously discussed some 2020 goals that the that National Grid had published and um, specifically and this is what Mr. Shabazzpour was not familiar with and I'd be happy to share this document it's called Our Contribution which lays out that by 2020, um, National Grid will reuse or recycle all of their recovered assets. They will reduce their greenhouse gas emissions by, by 45%, and they will be sending zero office waste to a landfill, and uh, they will drive a net gain in environmental value on major construction projects by 2020, um, as well as enhance the value of their natural assets. Um, on at least 50 sites by 2020. So I don't know if you know offhand whether or not those goals were accomplished, but I was hoping to understand the uh, degree of success that the company has had at meeting its goals in the past. And that was why I asked the question. Um, I know, again, I've only been here six months, so apologies. I, I'm not exactly familiar with the details of this program. I can certainly uh, get you specifics as it relates to where and how we're hitting these goals. Um, thank you. I've I've taken I've taken the link, um, and I am attempting, and I will definitely share it to try to get some clarification. I know that we have done a lot internally um, to decarbonize what we are as a company, um, but again, I can get you more specifics on this. Um, and please hold me accountable. I will certainly get you follow up. Um, right, wrong, and different. Great. Thanks. So I have this. That's question one of three. My my. Second question is in regards to this statement that Mr. Shabazzpour made, and I recognize you're not Mr. Shabazzpour, so, uh, but I would really like to answer the question. Um, specifically, he said that one of the reasons 2050 is selected is because in 2050, apparently tw there were 30 to 60% of buildings that you will use electricity to heat as of that time. And the data that apparently substantiates this comes from consultants. And what I was hoping to understand is exactly where this data is, and is there a way that we could have that shared with us? Because um, I, as I noted at the last meeting, I'm going to be 67 years old in 2050, and it's very possible. And indeed, we've spoken with elected officials after this who who said that if we wait till 2050 to go zero carbon as a society, we're all going to be underwater. Um, so I, I guess that's my question. And would, would it be possible to try and figure out as a as a follow up where that uh, consultant data comes from? 
Certainly, but that 2050 goal, I just want to note for you, that is not our goal. That's the state goal. So that would oh, be yeah, designated by whomever their in, internal consultant is. I would, we can certainly ask, but I think that you probably would have better luck talking to somebody, one of your state electors and having them ping NYSERDA to PSC or someone like that to try to figure out where specifically well, I, you like that number from. I, I, be, I, I think it's certainly, you know, a question that could be raised with anyone who substantiates this, but Mr. Shabazzpour came here and said that there was this specific work that the consultants did that, that came to that conclusion. And I, I would just like to kind of know the answer to where uh, the, the data came from to substantiate that, because I certainly don't think that National Grid should have stayed, but we had a later presentation in that meeting from Con Ed, and Con Ed is, is targeting an earlier date for um, achieving net zero carbon emissions. I believe 2040 was what they said at the meeting. And you know anything that we can do to progress and create more urgency around um, getting to this point in a responsible manner, I would be would be really helpful. So uh, absolutely, I, I again I take your point. I can certainly follow up on that. But I would also like to note, uh, Con Ed only operates in New York City. We have a statewide profile. So as we need to be responsible for the five boroughs, we also need to consider what this transition looks like for Brooklyn. Um, excuse me for Buffalo as well. Okay. Thanks. The I can final... certainly try to follow up on, that, on that, that specific answer. Okay. The final thing that I wanted to talk about, and maybe somewhat moot now that the, that the CLCPA scoping plan is pushing for an earlier date, but it came up in the context of the fact that the onus was going to be mainly on the ratepayers to engage in energy efficiency from 2021 to 2035. And then in 2035, National Grid would start reducing their gas, inf their, their, their gas network at that point. But um, there is a different document that is called the, uh, the, the supplement. And I got a link to this thing also. Um, you all have a lot of uh, initiatives and that's, that's always a good thing, but I, I also wanna make sure I understand them. Where on page 11 of this document, there's a figure entitled figure three that is basically premised on the idea that people are gonna be increasing their demand for gas over the next 15 years. And it's a, the, the, the figure is called the demand day gas supply. Um, and the source in the report just says national grid analysis. And I was hoping I could get my hands on the actual national grid analysis that was the source for that because just seeing national grid analysis, I don't have like a link or a study to go to, to, to understand where that came from. So you said figure three on page 11. Correct. I see figure four, figure three. Oh, on, on, on PDF page 11, uh, document page 10. Gotcha. Um, certainly we can, uh, any, Again, one of the, the things that I appreciate about, you know, what our engineers and experts do at National Grid is anything that they uh, present and put in writing, we can we can prove empirically um, through reports and things of that nature. So I will certainly circle back um, and get you an answer um, to the best of my ability on that. And again, if, if you all, if it will be helpful for you all to the extent that you guys have these types of specific questions, um, uh, Jessica, Alejandro, you guys will want to sit down with some of our subject matter experts attorney and really hash some of these things out. Uh, we encourage that. I would say what to date, what national, what I appreciate National Grid is we've engaged with a lot of, you know, advocacy uh, communities. And again, notwithstanding, right, it's a corporation, you know, you know, you don't can't necessarily get everything that you want. But I think that having the conversation amongst us and giving you guys expertise and having some practical suggestions to effectuate some of these things um, that you would like to see, I think um, would be helpful. Okay, well, no, thank you for that. I, I wanna invite anyone else who's here, including any board members or members of the public to also ask a question if they'd like, just a reminder, if you're asking questions, you, you need to pose it to the chair. Um, but did anyone else have a question for Mr. Seabrook? Yep, I do. Oh, great. Um, could you just state your name for the record? And um, like everyone else, we ask that you keep your question or comment to two minutes. Okay, my name's Joe, even though it shows up as Janet, that's my wife's name. I couldn't follow all the slides because it was so fast. So what is your last name? Bada, B-O-T-T-A. 
Thank you. Okay. So did your slide state that let's say my boiler breaks down in 10 years, my gas boiler, am I required to retrofit and pay two to three times more per year for electricity to heat a home? Um, to the wait, extent wait, 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 wait. Mr. Oh, Seabrook, I'm sorry for this. I'm just going to jump in for one second. And Mr. Bada, thank you for your question. I'll but you are going to let him answer though, please. No, I'm going to answer. I'm going to let okay, him answer in a second. In, cut in. Well, I know the reason I cut in is because when I first granted you the floor to speak, I explained that the questions need to be raised to the chair in the meeting. The way well, that we I proceeded- Jessica is the chair. Isn't Jessica the chair? No. Mr. Mr. Bada, I, I'm the chair of this meeting. Um, it's, it's, it's nice to have you and I'm happy to facilitate your question, but we all do need to proceed with the, the rules that we, we have for, uh, for meeting protocol. And I'll, I'll be happy to direct your question for Mr. Seabrook to answer, um, but I just wanted to make sure you're aware because a lot of the time folks in the com who, who come in and ask questions will ask a question directly to a presenter and then there'll be kind of a back and forth. And we, we try not to have that at the committee um, just so that folks, everything can stay respectful and we can, we can have a nice productive conversation. So if everybody is good with that, um, Mr. Seabrook, I assume you heard the question. You can proceed now to answer it if you like. Oh, yes, thank you. I would say um, it depends. And I apologize for giving the legal answer, but it really depends on the infrastructure that your home has to the extent that your home um, does not have the ability to, to suit uh, some uh, transition of that appliance. Um, depending on what appliance that is, um, a retrofit will be necessary. Um, depending again on the nature of your home, where it is, zoning, historical nature of it, things of that nature. Um, we do have estimates that you know retrofits um, of those types of nature can are cost tens of thousands of dollars, particularly in uh, places in New York City. And how much does it cost currently per year to heat with electric versus natural gas? Is it two or three times more per year? Okay. Um, Mr. Seabrook, I'll give you the opportunity to ask answer that, but Mr. Bada, I'm just going to ask you to wait for a second after Mr. Seabrook answers. Thanks. Um, I would say, again, it depends, um, but I will give this answer. What we have done, um, and so it certainly would be much more costly. And then also from an environmental perspective, to the extent that a lot of the renewables that are contemplated being developed aren't currently online. If we took the entire gas system that we have right now and move it to electric, electricity, we'd actually be emitting more because most of the electricity that we have uh, today comes from burning fossil fuels. Well, we have no idea about okay. the cost. Mr. Bada, I'm I, sorry, I, Chairman. This is a give and take. You know, it's a limited amount of time. Let's have a give and take. It's only fair. Mr. Bada, we're going to have. Uh, I'll let Mr. Seabrook answer you this last question, Thank you. but we're going to have to move on after that. I understand, Mr. but it is a give and take. Um, I would say, Mr. Bada, uh, we we would estimate that in most instances, it would most likely cost more. Okay. Well. Thank you very much, Mr. Seabrook, for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. We'll look forward to following up with you, and perhaps we can get some other folks as well, too, as nice as it is to speak with you, to, to talk about things for, about this from um, other uh, SME perspectives. Absolutely. Um, I would say definitely. I, I, I welcome the, the contra narrative. The contra perspectives, because I think it's very important that we hear from the people about what the pain points are. I, I tend to become relatively frustrated by hearing it, the people who get paid to do this for a living. So to the extent that you guys are doing this from the community, for the community, Jessica, Alejandro, all of you guys who raised questions, I really appreciate it. And then I would say, as we um, submit some um, responses to some of the things that you've left outstanding, to the extent that any other questions come up and or you guys have specific folks that you think could be helpful in terms of a follow-up conversation um, please let me know and I will facilitate. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, thank All you. Right. All right. Now, for everyone who's here this evening, um, you may have remember we did not actually kick off our meeting because um, we didn't have quorum at the beginning of the presentation. But we've had several other uh, folks from the committee join us. Um, and I'd like to give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves and then we can proceed with the rest of the agenda. Uh, Ms. Einhorn, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Lindsay Einhorn. I'm a member of CB2, a member of the Hess Committee, as well as the Economic Development and Employment Committee. Uh, great. Ms. Cumberbatch. 
Good evening, my name is Monique Cumberbatch. I'm a member of Community Board 2 and of the House Committee. Great, uh, Ms. Cobb. Yeah, my name is uh, Akosua Cobb and I'm a member of the House Committee. Thank you. Thank you, it's great to see you here. Um, I know we have Mr. Andrews here too, but I want to give a special welcome to our new member, Mr. Jeffrey Ryan, who joins us tonight. Um, Mr. Ryan, welcome to the committee. Um, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Jeffrey Ryan, and uh, I've been uh, assigned to this committee, and I look forward to working with everyone. Great. We look forward to working with you too, Mr. Ryan. Thanks so much for yeah. joining us. Um, awesome. So uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, we have Ms. Carolyn uh, Hubbard coming on weary and uh, Ms. Latrell Masso, who are members of the board in attendance tonight. Uh, I'm going to proceed now with the uh, agenda um, with the caveat that we do the National Grid presentation first. Could I ask if anyone wants to make a motion to approve tonight's agenda? A motion to approve tonight's agenda. Ms. McKnight. Second. Who, uh, sorry, who is the second? Alejandro. Oh, Mr. Mr. Varela, okay. So Ms. McKnight, Mr. Varela. Um, and Ms. McKnight, is that with the caveat that we have the presentation yes, first? with the caveat, Wonderful. with the caveat, yes. Okay, um, on the committee, is there anyone who does not approve or abstains from approving tonight's agenda? Okay, let the record reflect that the agenda is approved. We're now going to move on to the minutes of October 2022. And I assume that folks have had this distributed to them previously. Um, can I get a motion uh, in regards to the minutes of October 2022? I uh, offer a motion to accept the minutes for October 22. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. I second your motion. Um, or if you have any edits or corrections, please just email the board office or, or our, our wonderful secretary. Um, and uh, if you were not uh, present at the, the last meeting, I would just ask that you abstain from the motion as that's our usual practice. Um, so uh, at this point, I will ask, does anyone want to abstain or, or um, uh, disapprove the, the minutes from October 2022? Uh, Ms. Cobb, are you abstaining or? I'm abstaining. Okay. And did I see a hand from you also, Mr. Ryan? Okay. Yes, I will okay. abstain. Great. Anyone else want to disapprove or abstain this? Okay, we can treat this as passed with uh, two abstentions. Um, next up on the agenda, we have um, a uh, the district level community health update. Now, normally our member, Ms. Anadu, will cover this. She's not here tonight. So I'm gonna try to give you a brief snapshot of an attempt at meeting her, although you will probably quickly note that it is nowhere near the level of sophistication that Ms. Anadu provides. Um, looking at COVID-19, as we do every month, the uh, new case average for New York City has stayed around 2,000. As of yesterday, November 1st, it was 1570. And just a couple of days ago, though, it shot up all the way to 7,000 for uh, October 31st. Seven-day average is at 2378. And within our local community, it's, um, it's helpful, I guess, to check in again on those different zip codes that are around us. Um, in regards to vaccination, it seems that 11201, downtown Brooklyn, Dumbo, Brooklyn Heights is standing at 92% uh, completing 
the, the primary vaccine series, 99% with one dose, 11217 Borum Hill Park Slope is sitting with 79% completing the primary vaccine and 90% with at least one dose. And 11205, which has been historically sort of lagging behind the other zip codes with respect to um, the uh, COVID statistics, is standing with 59% completed the primary vaccine series and 68% with at least one dose. And just diving a little deeper into 11205, because that's been our point of discussion in the past, it seems that the case rate there is um, at 30,549 per 100,000, which is about twice as high as the both the Brooklyn and the New York City rate. The death rate does seem to be lower, um, but the, va the vaccination rate is, is also much lower. Um, it's only 68%, which is just at least one dose, where the Brooklyn standard is 81% and the New York City standard is 89%. Um, I would just offer for the for the update, and I'm sorry, again, I don't have the charts and graphs that Ms. Anadu normally comes with in this regard. It's important for all of us to remember to stay uh, vigilant and remember the common precepts of COVID-19, um, that it, it's you, you always can um, be safer wearing a mask than not wearing a mask. You can be safer getting vaccinated than not getting vaccinated. And it's always safer being outdoors than being indoors. And sometimes we can't always accomplish those things, but those are the, the things that, um, that nobody seems to have disproven over the course of this, uh, this, uh, this situation, which despite what it, everybody says, doesn't seem like it's over from the course of looking through the statistics. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions on the COVID-19 uh, presentation for tonight? Um, if not, we can move on to the next part of the agenda. And that's board members, members of the public, anyone. Go ahead, Brandon. It's a go, Brandon. Okay. Well, nice to hear from you, Victor. I'm glad that we got you here. I Did you have a question or, or, or you're, you wanted me to move on? Uh, no, everything's a go around here. Okay. Anyone else have a question about the COVID-19 briefing or we want to move on to the next item on the agenda? I'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, next up, we have our open session for public comment on adopted agenda items. So for folks here in the, in the community, this is a time in our meeting agenda where we have agenda items coming up, namely we've got some liquor licenses coming up, um, a new liquor license at 20 Columbia Clover Hill, as well as a number of renewals. And to be very clear, you will have an opportunity to comment when we present this, and it may be helpful for you to hear the presentation first, but if there's anything you just gotta get off your chest right now and you wanna talk about it, we've got this section here in the agenda for you to 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 announce that and I'll invite anyone from the public to make such a comment right now. Again, this is only about items that are on our agenda. Was there anyone who wanted to make such a comment? All right, I'm hearing none. So I'm gonna move on to the next part of the agenda which is our New York State Liquor License Application Reviews. We have one new application this month. It is from 20 Columbia Street, Clover Hill. Um, do we have somebody here from that location? Yes. Hi, Mr. Levy. Nice to see you again. Right. Um, you too. I understand we had you here in February of 2022, so it'd be great to have hear <clears throat> your presentation and um, and probably why, why you're coming back. Sure. <clears throat> and actually, you heard it even earlier than that. I think this application was uh, originally heard in 2019, um, and the application was approved by this board and was then filed with the State Liquor Authority and was approved there as well. The application was conditionally approved, uh, but due to some DOB issues that were sort of out of my client's immediate control, he actually couldn't activate the license in time. So he wound up withdrawing the application and then I think everybody knows what happened in 2020. Um, 
and the, the financial woes and obviously the restrictions on restaurants following that had made it really difficult uh, for them to move forward. So then we can fast forward to March of 2022 when we appeared back in front of this board uh, and this application, which has remained the same, was approved yet again. Um, as you guys are aware, there's a time limit on how long community board notification periods are good for. That period has lapsed as we've been trying feverishly to get this application ready to go. Again, there have been some holdups, um, but my client is now ready to go. And before we can file with the state, we have to come back and refresh our notice with the board. So that's sort of a, a brief recap of what's been happening over the last three years or so since we started this process initially. So the application before you is unchanged from the iterations you've seen before and have approved before and the liquor authorities even approved before, but just procedurally, we have to do this again. And, and it's unfortunate because um, as you guys might be aware, there's been some legislative changes over the last few months that have actually made it so that complying with the CFO or letter of no objection requirement is no longer required to activate a license. So uh, if that had been rolled out in 2020 or 2019, uh, we would have been able to activate a conditional license at that time and, and we wouldn't have to have to be here again. But but here we are, I believe my client's on the call. Um, but again, small restaurant, Brooklyn Heights received a Michelin star recently um, and everything's unchanged from the last application you saw. Okay. Um, and I, I think we appreciate that. I, I, I saw that nothing had changed. Just a couple quick questions about the, how, how it's been going. Is the, the business operating now? The business is operating now. I believe my clients are on the call who, who probably would be better suited to, to answer the operational questions than I would. Oh, okay. yes. Uh, I'm, I'm currently online. Uh, my name is Gabriel. I was the 631 number that was connected earlier, but I switched over to Zoom. Um, I'm one of the owners here at Clover Hill, and yes, we are operational right now from Tuesday to Saturday, uh, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Okay. Have there been any concerns expressed by anyone in the neighborhood about noise or anything like that? No, none at all that we're aware of. Okay. Um, any questions by members of the committee? Brandon, I have one. I just can't find my hand. Okay, sure. Ms. Thurston? Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to clarify, I've heard wonderful things. Um, do you, are you currently serving alcohol at all? Or what has, been, have you had a BYOB policy? What what has been the situation? No, they're, they're not currently serving alcohol. There was a brief period where there was a BYOB and that was some bad advice that they had gotten previously. It's come to their attention that that's not okay and it's not legal um, and they have ceased that. Um, mm -hmm. That bad advice did not come from me. I gave them the good advice that they can't do that. Um, and it was around the time also that they were kind of gearing up to hopefully get this Michelin star. And that's such an important part of the process. And, and that was an important part of their, their, their whole execution. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that they weren't aware they couldn't do, and now they are aware and they are not doing. Thank you. And that is why I asked, I read the Michelin review and realized this might be operating without a liquor license. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, hey, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Andrews, yes. I'm wondering, are you are they wheelchair accessible in, out, and do they have any accessible bathroom? That's what I'm wondering. Okay. Um, so the question is about your wheelchair accessibility. Do you, do you have wheelchair accessibility to the, the, the front of the restaurant as well as to the bathroom? Uh, currently, we're not allowed to make any changes to the outside of the building since we are a landmark building. We've addressed this issue with the building uh, several times, and it's been a little bit of a difficult process, but currently there's a single really small step that leads to the um, to the leads inside the restaurant. Uh, we've had some uh, guests that had uh, needed a little bit of help with a wheelchair and there's always a host by the door that's able to help and accommodate people that come in with wheelchairs or that have that sort of uh, they're, they're, special thing. Mr. They're, Andrews, they're, before, can, can we wait for a second? I, I wanna allow the, the applicant to answer the question. Um, is, is the bathroom accessible? I just wanted to understand that point also. Yes, the bathroom, there's a ramp that leads to the bathroom. Okay, great. 
Mr. Andrews, did you have a follow-up um, question? That step is going to have to get looked into because if it's a power chair, that person in the power chair is going to slip over and it's going to be a huge problem. Now, if it's a manual chair, they can probably get out and probably pick up the chair. But if it's a power chair, that's going to be dangerous and that person might fall out or fall, the chair might fall on top of them trying to get into the restaurant. So we really need to look at that. Okay, well, thanks for your comment, Mr. Andrews. And just for clarity, Mr. Marino or Mr. Levy, is there anything you can do about the step or it, it, what? I think you said that there was an issue with the building that was preventing you from doing that. Yeah, we're currently not allowed to make any changes to the front uh, face of the of the building because it's a landmark. We can so certainly are... look into, you know, some sort of, um, you know, ramp overlay that could maybe solve the problem temporarily as we're trying to figure out a better solution. Okay. Um, Mr. Ryan, um, I see your hand is raised. Would you like to ask yes, a question? Yes, uh, I, I think he, um, either Mr. Marino or Mr. Levy have already addressed what I was going, I, I was thinking about that you can buy uh, metal uh, portable ramps that you can put in place uh, to make it accessible until such time they can make the necessary changes. And, okay. and it can be available, it can be available, you know, as, as long as the, the, uh, the restaurant is open and whoever's at the door can put it down when you have to make it wheelchair accessible um, throughout the course of the, of the business day. It's a very small investment, and I think it would be a, a, a very simple temporary fix. Okay. Thanks for your comment, Mr. Ryan. Um, Mr. Levy, Mr. Marino, is, is putting something like that in a something that you all would be interested in doing? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Great. As long as the building is uh, um, okay with it, then, then yeah, for sure, we should be able to do that. Okay. Great. Well, thanks for your suggestion, Mr. Ryan. Um, any, other, any other questions from members of the board or members of the public for this application? Members of the board or members of the public, we're talking about 20 Columbia here, Clover Hill. While we do that, I'll note that the office has registered seven near local indications of support, four same block letters of support, and zero indications of objection. And I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'll ask the committee whether we um, uh, anyone has a motion that they would like to make. Um, Alejandro here, move to move to support the applicant. Um, I wonder, or I just, maybe it's not um, part of the motion or guide me, Brandon, if it could be, but just if we could get some, a response about whether that, um, that suggestion that Mr. Ryan made about the ramp is something that they will be in touch with the owner of the building about if that's something that's allowed so that we know it's, whether it's gonna happen or not. Okay. So we can discuss that when you we have our, our discussion, but we do need somebody to second your motion. Second. Does anyone want to, oh, we got a second from Jessica and thanks for being willing to give up the motion. I did see your hand was up first, Ms. Thurston. Um, so discussion on the motion. Um, I, I, does anybody want to uh, offer their, their, their comment on Mr. Varela's suggestion? I think the, the question is about whether or not we have a, a um, uh, whether or not we we can we should do anything with regard to the motion in regards of this uh, temporary wheelchair accessible ramp. Um, I, I I can think my, of my my uh, my I'll offer my thought, which is um, I think it's great that the applicant's interested in doing it. Um, I, I think that there, there may be some challenges with enforcing it because there are a, um, because there seems to, to be um, an, a third party that could potentially prevent the, the, uh, the ramp from being installed. 
Um, but if anybody has a creative suggestion that they think could work, I'd be happy to entertain it. And, and I, I think the ultimate question is back for you, Mr. Varela, because you're the one who made the motion. Well, since I didn't add it to the motion per se, we saved it for the discussion. I just was kind of hoping sort of a, it's a sort of a friendly suggestion or request that they could report back to us on what the status of the ramp is. If it's the owner of the building who is standing in the way of this, um, you know, uh, I'd like, you know, just for them to report back and say whether they were able to get this ramp in or not, or. Yeah, I, 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 I think you, you got a great idea there. And I think Taya has given us another great reminder, which is that ADA considerations are not under the, are under the purview of the New York City Department of Buildings and not part of the SLA application. So state liquor authority is not going to be looking for compliance in that regard. But Mr. Levy and Mr. Marino, um, we, we do suggest to you in a in a friendly manner that you you look into this and 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 try to pursue it um and I, with that you all willing to do something like that yeah, yeah. I, I will definitely follow up for sure okay great thanks we'll look forward to hearing from you um anyone else on the committee have any questions or comments on the motion hearing none I would like to vote in favor. Uh, Ms. Thurston, how do you vote? In favor. Um, Mr. Ryan? In favor. Uh, Mr. Varela? In favor. Uh, Ms. Cobb? In favor. Ms. McKnight? In favor. Uh, Ms. Einhorn? In favor. Uh, Ms. Cumberbatch? Approved. And Mr. Andrews? In favor. Great. Congrats again. Nice to see you and, and hope this time it works out. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hope, hopefully this is the last time with this one. Great. All right. Take care, everybody. Wow. Wow. Um, as much as we love to see Mr. Levy and Mr. Marino, how great is it to only have one new liquor license on our agenda tonight, especially after we had 10 <laughs> last month? That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is our renewals. Um, we have a number of them and I'll read them out. 71 Pineapple, Vineapple Cafe, 128 Smith, Bar to Back, 1 Green, Bomb in the Wind, 37 Washington, Il Porto, um, 90 Furman, uh, Meadow Rue at one hotel, 170 Smith, S. Sam Bistro, 139 Flatbush, Buffalo Wild Wings, 925 Fulton, Hanson Dry, 115 Smith, Kyoto. Ms. Muller, um, has the board office received any complaints or concerns from members of the community about these locations? I have not, and we registered some complaints um, at the last renewal about one hotel in Hanson Drive, but those seem to have disappeared this year. Okay, I'm I'm not sure exactly which the uh, uh, what the uh, nature of what of the issue with Hanson with Hanson Dry was, but I do remember the one hotel, and I remember that that was largely driven by the rooftop pool, and I don't know if this. Uh, Meadow rule is is even located up there, but if we don't have any concerns, then we don't have any concerns. Um, are there any members of the committee, the board, or members of the public here who are have a specific concern or comment about any of these specific liquor licenses that are up for renewal? And hearing none, I will ask, does anyone want to make a motion for the renewals? Jessica, uh, you're, I assume you're moving to approve. Jessica moves to approve. I second Lindsay the motion. Oh, Lindsay is, I'm gonna give Lindsay the second. Lindsay will second the motion. Um, with no discussion, um, I vote in favor. Ms. Cumberbatch, how do you vote? In favor. Uh, Mr. Varela, how do you vote? 
In favor. Um, Ms. Thurston. In favor. Ms. Cobb. In favor. Mr. Ryan. In favor. Ms. McKnight. Approve. Uh, Ms. Einhorn. Approve. Uh, Ms. Cumberbatch. Approve. And Mr. Andrews. Yes. Great. So the renewals are unanimously approved. Chairperson's report. Right I'm just saying. Uh, you know, Mr. I, Andrews, I, I you it 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 it. wonderful. Uh, chairperson's report for the evening. I won't have too long of a report, but um, I, I will note I I met with the um, New Beginnings uh, Shelter Community Advisory Board last week and got an update on the shelter at One Hoyt Street, which um, is apparently uh, nearly full at the moment. They have 157 out of 160 beds occupied. Um, it seemed like a good meeting. There were no complaints raised about the, the, the service there. Um, the, there was a, a good discussion about folks in the community donating different um, uh, items to the, uh, to, the, to the center so that there could be appropriate COVID supplies and such. And there was some discussion about the artwork that some of the folks there are working on, which was really nice and frankly great to hear. So it sounds like things are going okay there and I'll keep the committee updated about this as this goes, al goes along. Um, other than that, I'm gonna suggest that we discuss under other committee business, our plans or what we should do in regards to a health fair in 2023. And I'll stop there for the evening with my report. And thank you all for um, sticking with us after last, last month's three hour meeting. Um, so other business, um, aside from my issue, did anyone have any other business that they wanted to raise? Ms. McKnight. So last Thursday, I actually went to a Brooklyn swab. I think that's what they call. I'll look at it. The Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board. They're, they are a voluntary board who reports to the Brooklyn Borough President. So I attended their meeting last Thursday and they were looking to get input, input actually from community board members about um, our concerns and feedback. They had us break into various breakout groups to discuss our concerns. I thought it was informative. And one of the things that came up is um, a couple, or maybe it was just one community board actually invited the RAT Academy to do a presentation with their committee for, for them to receive input. and. And also the Brooklyn Bar Borough President did um, come to the meeting and I, get, and I see that this is something that is definitely on his agenda or as a priority. And that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. Well, thanks for sharing that, Ms. Mm -hmm. McKnight. Um, Ms. Thurston, did you want to respond to Ms. McKnight or did you have a separate item to discuss? Yeah, I just, and, and maybe this was clear after that meeting, but I'll just share for anyone who doesn't know, Betty Feibush, our incredible chair of the Yucca Committee, is, I guess, on their board, Swab's board, or is otherwise deeply involved. So she's also a great resource, too, to have. I'm so glad we're sort of getting some community board swab cross-pollination. Yeah, I, I guess the sentiment, maybe we should have a meeting in the future that's that that discusses some of these topics. You know, one of the great benefits of our committee is we get to handle so many different things. And one of them is this this issue of, of sanitation, waste. And we've we had definitely had some great meetings last year on the subject of composting and of um, different ways that we can uh, try to eliminate waste and and contribute to um, environmental safety and security for our community in the future. So um, we, we can definitely uh, chat about that as we work to, with the board office in the future. And um, thank you for raising it, Ms. McKnight. Um, any other comments on Ms. McKnight and Brooklyn Swab? All right. Um, 
the uh, the health fair. I want to briefly talk about this. The health fair is, uh, and for those of you who are new, um, our our committee, in conjunction with one of the board members, um, and I invite Miss Masso to participate in this as she was a, a driving force behind this, uh, the driving force behind this. Um, our, our committee played an instrumental role in really a revolutionary event this year, which was in June, there was a, uh, a fair that we held on behalf of the whole community in Commodore Berry Park, and um, particularly trying to target Farragut uh, residents there and, uh, and really offering a range of different services. I, I can't even begin to describe all the different things that existed there from um, from there was a, 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 a van there that was performing um, uh, colonoscopy type screenings. There was a, um, a uh, uh, there was blood pressure checks. There was Brooklyn Hospital. There was, it, thank you to whomever is presenting this because it, I can't remember all of the great uh, services that were there, but it was so many different people and so many different elected officials it was a really wonderful event and for it to be the inaugural time that we did this and we had so much success and including a panel on maternal health how can i forget this i was on the panel um the uh it, it was a uh, really wonderful event and we can do this uh potentially again next year if everybody's interested um the things that i would just say generally is we should start thinking about it now and maybe choose a date and a look and a park soon because these spots one they they fill up you know we learned last year after reserving it in like february march that another organization had already reserved to do another health fair in the park the same day and while it was great to work with them it would be also great to kind of get be the first ones to put the 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 application in so that we can work through the permitting process a little bit easier. There are also certain services that book up six months in advance. Um, services that are that can be very helpful to people. Uh, cancer screenings and um, uh, certain kinds of COVID testing are. Um, at least maybe not anymore, but definitely last year and we'll see in the future we're in high demand. So I, I, I say that because if we can try to figure out a date and a, a place to do it for this year, um, even tonight, but you know, I don't want to be too over anxious, but I love to foster a little discussion about it. Um, there could be some value in, in going back to the, the, the park that we went to last year at Commodore Berry. There could be some value in going to a new park. Um, Mr. Singletary has a initiative with Brooklyn Hospital where he works called uh, Docks in the Park, which is a, a great initiative and it's very particular to Fort Greene Park. And um, I, I also feel, you know, we, we might also have an opportunity to target um, a, a particular side or of Fort Greene Park that would be advantageous to reaching out to the local community there. But I'm not saying we have to choose that. I just want to pose that as another option. And uh, I invite anyone else to, to comment on, on that. And, and maybe I'll, I'll throw out a potential date and see what folks think of June 25th, which is the weekend after Juneteenth and Father's Day. Um, so thoughts from the committee on these kind of things. Um, feel free to suggest alternatives as well, too. Um, Jessica, I thought you had your hand up, too. Well, just acknowledging my bias on this side of the district, um, I, I'll also toss Borough Hall uh, and the sort of plaza around it as an option if we also wanted to maybe have Antonio and Lincoln kind of help raise awareness and stuff. Although I'm, I'm sure Crystal would as well um, and did before. But um, yeah, just one other place we can always look to. Okay, great. Jessica, uh, can you mention what was the um, other park or location I missed it? I was just thinking, you know, like right outside Borough Hall where the farmer's market is, right oh, outside yes. the okay. Hall stop. Okay. Um, just like, like where the the new not Bryant Park, our version of Bryant Park shopping mm -hmm. plaza will be. Okay. And, and that'd be a good sort of test to see how it goes too. Cool. Um, uh, anyone else from the committee have thoughts on on this? 
I like the date and we can have, I agree with Fort Greene Park as being um, a good choice. We don't need to do it on decal side. We could do it on the other side of the park. I forget okay. the street over there. Oh, uh, I know Emily Myrtle, will be on this. Myrtle Avenue. Yes. yes. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, Ms. McKnight. Um, anyone else? Ms. Masso, did you want to add anything? I just want to incorporate you because you were such a, a force in last year's fair. Do we still have Ms. Masso? We had her for a second. Let's try you're muted. I may, Brandon, jump in while Latrell is figuring that out. I just, I would, my advocacy for there being more, more around uh, climate change and this sort of the conversation we were having today during at the beginning of the meeting, but maybe presenting the more sort of scientific side or uh, the more community based side to it. That could yeah, happen here. A... That could happen here too. Oh, but, but for sure, maybe that could be a part of the, of the fair this year. No, I, I think that's a good suggestion. We can talk about like subject matter and things that can get discussed, whether we wanna have one panel, two panels, no panels or, or things like that too. Um, but I think very much at this stage, I wanna kind of figure out the basics because we can, what we gotta put on the application is like, what is the, the place we wanna do it and the day that we wanna do it. Um, I think, um, was it my imagination or did you, Mr. Mr. Ryan, have your hand up at some point in this? Uh, yes, I did. I, I just want to say, I, I thought it was a success. Uh, I attended, um, you know, I, I made the rounds. Uh, it was very informative. I had a great time. Uh, I think everybody else that, that, you know, that, that showed up, I definitely think we should do it. Some of the locations that were suggested, even if we went back to Commodore Perry Park, I mean, I'm, that would be fine with me, but um, Barrow Hall or Fort Green Park. But I definitely think that we should do it. And I, it was, I just thought it was absolutely great. I had a, it was very informative, and I had a good time. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Ryan. I appreciate your comments in that regard. Um, Hi, this is Latrell. Yes, I think we should do it again. Awesome. Okay. Did Did you have a preference, Latrell, between? Um, any of the different parks or, or, or Borough Hall area or, or, or uh, um, uh, I guess Fort Greene or, or uh, Commodore Berry? No, I don't. Okay. Whichever one everybody agree on is fine. Okay. Hey, Brendan, it's Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay. Um, so there were, I think there were two, I, we kind of like informally hot washed the, the folks that did it last year. And I thought maybe we could just talk about some of the, one of the main things that I think we talked about was that there were only a couple members of the committee there and not many members of the general board who came last year. And so making sure that we not just have the emotional support of everyone, but the, the physical support of everyone who wants, um, the health fair to move forward. And so thinking about how we ensure that we have that, that physical backing of, of everyone to make sure that it's executed well, um, I think is really important before we move forward. And then also thinking about maybe sending a survey monkey to the vendors who came last year, making sure that they're willing to come back, making sure that they're willing to support on a specific day at a specific place um, so that we're building on what we we worked on last year versus again starting from scratch. Okay. Well, that 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 those are great suggestions too. Um, and I guess then maybe your suggestion we we table our official decision on what we want to do until like maybe next meeting in December. Okay. Yeah, maybe we do some like a informal smaller meeting for folks that want to be the core committee. Um, get a little bit more organized, talk about what the goal is um, and who we want to serve, uh, you know, I, and, and thinking about what measures of success we're looking for so that as we build it, um, 
hopefully they come based on, on what those measures of success are and, and we can build around that. Okay. Well, I, I think one, it sounds like reasonable ideas and uh, two, we can kind of um, explore things in the meantime. Of course, I, I always remember we don't have subcommittees here at Community Board 2, but it'd be great to uh, figure out anything that we can in between now and the next meeting. And I, I look forward to um, seeing where that goes. Um, did anybody have any concerns with June 25th as a potential date? I guess I, sh I, can, I can say that because maybe we, we can kind of vet that out and tease that as the potential date. It's a Saturday. Um, I'd suggest maybe we start a little bit later in the day than last year's uh, fair, just because the people I'm came sorry. out a little bit later. Ms. Moss, can I say something? I'm sorry. Sure. I, I, I have missed the piece also because I had stepped away, but I think June 25th is, we had a problem because a lot of people went away last year during that time period. That's like right before school um, closed. So what a lot of, I think it would be better to do it earlier in June if possible than later in June. Because I think a lot of people was going away. And I think that's why one of the reasons, Lindsay, we didn't have a big turnout for a lot of people. It was also after the board rested for the summer. And so like making it before the board closes activities for the year is probably not a bad idea. Okay. I agree with Latrell. That's that's all to say I agree with Latrell. It's it's too late. It's too close to Fourth of July. People start getting summer fever. So that brings us back to definitely not June eighteenth. So June eleventh, June fourth. Would one of those dates be potentially concerning to um, to choose? Also, um, the earlier we decide on a date, um, I think the more vendors and the more people, because what we discovered last year was a lot of a lot of the vendors, the breast cancer, the you know, the um, mobile breast cancer van, a lot of the vendors they book up early, so we really need to make a decision sooner than later. Right. That's that's good to know. Well, um, I, I'm I'm okay with all of these dates. So I, I I really just need anybody else to say whether there's a there's an issue with them. Um, I'll, I'll say tentatively June fourth. Um, Didn't we do Saturday last year, Brendan? I'm sorry. I thought June fourth was a Saturday. Is it not? No, it's a Sunday. Sunday. Well, that wasn't my intention. I intended June 3rd. I said June 4th. So if we and say June 3rd, how does that work for everyone? That's fine. And June 24th is the Saturday. Right. And just to let Latrell and Lindsay know, I just checked the last day of school was June 28th. But the, the teenagers, the high school is might get out a little earlier. Okay. Well, do we want to say tentatively June third, and we'll check with the, the the folks that we we met with last year in between the this meeting and the next meeting, and see if they're they're also available June third, and maybe if they're not, we'll do June tenth. Aye. Yes. Okay. I agree. Well, we're we're we're, we're tentative, so we don't need to vote, but but <laughs> I. Okay. Mr. Ryan, I'm enjoying your first meeting here. I am appreciating your enthusiasm and I am looking forward to working with you on this. Um, okay. All right. So. I'm so sorry, Brandon. I don't need no, to keep saying no, 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 Ms. Ms. <laughs> I, I love to hear what you have to say too. So go ahead. Yeah, so Taya is reading my mind and, and actually just put this in the chat. Um, we, we should talk about a subcommittee. Um, and, a, and maybe people who are truly committed go into the subcommittee um, and put together a proposal for the next meeting that could be voted on by the committee as a whole. Well, um, Ms. Muller, do you have any guidance for us on creating a subcommittee of, the, of this committee? Um, Ms. Einhorn's suggestion is perfectly legit. 
the committee is free to form subcommittees as long as to talk and to discuss. You are only not allowed to make decisions in subcommittee. That's the that's the line. It does okay. make Lenny wary. So I, I'll just add that context. He's not a huge fan of subcommittees. So yeah, we should not make a final decision here. We should have a conversation. Right. Oh. I, I, I I liked it. I, I, I second Ms. Thurston's point in that regard. Um, so I, to I that think point, so. you could you could request you could request a subcommittee in mm -hmm. executive committee if you'd like a layer of approval. Also, right. just because he's wary doesn't mean it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It just means he's wary and we should talk to him about it. Mm -hmm. I, I just think not disagreeing, but it is. Right. The context is important. There's a lot mm -hmm. that goes on that not every board member is aware of. So it ultimately does create more work for folks. Right. But I, don't think uh, I agree, but I think we were hindered a lot last year by not really being able to meet um, to do planning. I mean, we did meet, but it, we were kind of limited. So I think in order to have an effective um event we do need to sit down and plan okay well i think these are all good in, in these are all good thoughts and and something that we can we can try to do and um but as as i, I as the the process is is such that as the chair of the community board i i would personally feel more comfortable if we did make sure that he's aware of the our intention to create a subcommittee before we actually do it. So um, I I think we'll, we'll have a discussion between now and the next meeting about that and see if he's um, on the same page with us in that regard. And then maybe we'll create a subcommittee at the next meeting. Um, and until then, um, we're tentatively thinking June 3rd. Um, I want to also kind of hash this out because this was another discussion where I know nobody is uh, is really in their heart pro Fort Greene Park, pro Commodore Berry Park, pro Borough Hall, but we need to make a decision about which one we want, we prefer as a committee. And um, I don't know if there's anything that is necessarily preventing us from at least tentatively reaching a decision about where we want to go there too. Um, so I'll, I'll put it out there at least first with respect to, um, Commodore Barry, is there any sort of really, uh, big concern with having it at Commodore Barry uh, again? Um, I would think, you know, it's the same place that we did last year. Um, it, uh, the the only other things I'll say is that Commodore Berry continues to be under construction, and there was no accessible bathroom to people at last year's fair. Um, and um, I guess also the I I don't know how I we'll definitely try to get attendance boosted from last year, and you always do better second time than first time, but we did make efforts to contact the uh, Farragut Tenant Association and to rally people to come out. And I, I don't know what the, uh, if the, what the, um, uh, I don't know if folks think that there was a lot of people who came out from there, but I, I didn't feel like there was a, a, a large ton of people from that community who came. Um, so th those are a couple of things to think about in regards to Commodore Berry Park. Um, with regard to Fort Green Park, does anybody have any thoughts or concerns about that? So maybe we should talk to friends of Commodore Berry Park too and see if they even want us back again. Um, Cause since they were co-doing this with us, um, it's, it's a worthwhile question as we choose a location. Um, and I think the same for, I'm not aware if Myrtle Park has a friends of, I, I don't believe they do. Um, I think Myrtle Avenue, I think Fort Green Park do have friends 
of Friends um, thing also, but also as far as Commodore Berry Park, that was one of their questions. They wanted us to come back. They was yeah. excited about the event. So that they was like, are you coming back next year? That was a okay. the biggest thing. For, so they want us back. Okay. Yeah, but we, we did have that know. conversation. And they're, they're, they're definitely waiting for us to let them know whether we would like yeah. to come back. And I don't know if we'll be coming back on the same date that they want to have the fair, because uh, they're, they're going to continue to do their health fair next year. And it's also going to be in June. And I don't know if it's going to be in June 3rd um, or June 10th. And who, who knows when it might be in June. So, so they, they want to partner. Yeah, Nicole, I think they, um, Brandy, I think they wanted to partner with us. I think they'll be willing to work with us when and we does, chose to go back there. And does anyone know, have a contact at the Fort Greene Friends of group? Um, I'm just curious about bases, right? Because to Brandon's point, while we had tons of vendor support, we did not have a big turnout from the community. And I think that's what we want. We want to make sure we're serving our community and, and understand where it would be best received. Emily may know because I think she's um, active with Fort Green uh, Park Conservancy. Right, that's what they've got is the Fort Green Park Conservancy. And there is there is a Friends of Fort Green Park group, which I'm a part of. Um, I don't, we're active mainly to save trees in Fort Green Park, but um, I'm sure they might be interested in partnering um, if they can bring awareness to their issues going on at Fort Green Park. And what part of Fort Green Park were you, because there's two parks, there's two, there's, there's two. The there's the Myrtle Avenue side you guys were thinking about. Um, yeah. The only thing is that that's barbecue central. So um, it really would depend on like what area, whether you wanna get further away from the street, that would give you, and there's, it's, there's a little bit of concrete area, but not much. So um, there's the basketball court is there also and lots of picnic tables. So I don't know if you would have the same amount of space that you would have at Commodore Mary Park. So just, you know, something to think about. Um, yeah, that is true. The decal side has more that open lawn. Can we right. talk to Barbara about doing a co-meeting with them and joining forces, getting more support? Um, I have to admit, I'm really not interested in doing it unless it's an official subcommittee with lots of support from the community board because it just takes so much work to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if we join with the parks committee, we get additional support. Um, okay. I, I think it's worthwhile we're reaching out to Barbara and I, you know, we'll see what they, what they want. They, they have every right to, to say they want to do it or, or not. And it, it's always good to partner with other committees. It's been my, our experience to do that in the past. Um, and I definitely take your point in that regard. Um, so I, I think this is good to have the talks about these things because I think unlike, you know, the, the, one of the big benefits of Commodore Berry Park is there definitely is all that space. You could have a hundred vendors in that, that large space area there and no problem. Um, also so, shady. <laughs> yeah, well, there, there is some shade. There is some shade, yeah, you know, you know that too. Um, Okay, so I know we're getting close to the hour. I want to wrap this up, but I also want to talk about Borough Hall because that suggestion was raised as well too. Um, what do we What do we think? Are I, I certainly the 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 pro would be um, close to elected officials. Um, our our borough president would not be able to say it was inconvenient to attend that a a, a health fair that is held there at the 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 plaza there. This is probably like Cadman Plaza area because that's where they have the the, the farmer's market. Um, I guess I, I would say the, the, the a challenge might, one challenge might be that it, it's not extremely close to uh, a community that we're, we're, we're looking to help like a NYCHA community um, and uh, who would be our target audience of, of people who we wanted to attend this fair. Um, that might be a, a thought. 
Yeah, but I, I invite other people to to tend to weigh in on that on that point too. No, that's my thoughts. I mean, it's not in an area. It's in an area where people, I think, have you know, I would assume have good health care, and are pretty much aware of you know what the health care needs are. So I would prefer it to be in a community that would benefit from it. We might have, you know, better foot traffic because of the location, but I think we'll get people that don't necessarily plan on coming there, but maybe pass by and participate. So you might have that foot traffic and you, of course, will have the support of the politicians. And, you know, I think it would, uh, speaking of them, I think, you know, because we pretty much had the same focus as um, our borough president for the last health fair, which was maternal health. But I think, you know, whatever we do um, involving them in some way, shape or form to see what support they can do, um, provide, or if we're thinking about the same focus, it'd be good to check in with them. Yeah, and I'll just suggest that the, the borough hall could help. I totally agree with all of that. It is an area that just because I live down the street, a lot of a lot of people are at on the weekends and not folks that necessarily live here. So I do wonder if there's value in learning even from Antonio's team, like do they have a sense of where folks come from who are passing through that plaza on the weekends? It, it might be valuable, but I totally agree. And I very much plus one Taya's point in the chat that like the subcommittee in whatever form it takes can further explore these options. But whichever date we want Alana, I would suggest a few to Antonio and the other politicians and maybe use that as your guide for the dates because their schedules will be the most difficult to work around. Yeah, it's helpful to think about. Um, great. Any other thoughts on Borough Hall area or because we uh, that was our, our latest topic. Okay, well, I think what we'll do at the next meeting is it's whatever the outcome is on the subcommittee and some of these outreach efforts that we have with parks or, um, or um, the speakers and, and such, we need to figure out three things at the next meeting. And that this is not gonna be done at the subcommittee, this will be done at our committee. It will be one, what day is this gonna occur? All right, first of all, do we wanna do this? Cause you know, there, there definitely is some, some thought and we need to formally decide we wanna do this. Two, what day do we wanna do it? And three, it seems we got three options, Borough Hall, Fort Greene Park and Commodore Berry Park which one of those three options is the place that we want to have this. So we've had a little discussion tonight. I wanna to ask everybody to think about what they prefer and, and have some flexibility because you know we're, we're gonna to try to reach a consensus between three options here. And um, we'll decide it at our December meeting. All right, next up on the agenda is community forum. This is for members of the community. You got two minutes to chat about anything you'd like to bring to our attention. Um, you don't have to if you don't want to, but if you do want to, please raise your hand and we'll be happy to give you two minutes to speak. <clears throat> and it looks like there is nobody who is speaking from community forum tonight, which is just fine. This brings us to our next item on the agenda, which is adjourn. Does anyone have a motion to adjourn the meeting tonight? Uh, Ms. Einhorn, do we have a second? A second. Second from, oh, second from Mr. Ryan. Okay. Um, all right, uh, anybody not in favor of adjourning or wants to abstain? Adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to put you as down in favor, Victor, and it seems like everybody else is too. Have a great yes. night, everybody. All Thanks right. so much Good for night. a great meeting. Good night. Good night. That's on your inaugural uh, meeting here, Mr. Ryan. It's nice to see you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>